Hello, uh, you hear me all right, Kat? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thanks, everyone, so far uh, for joining us this evening. I say we'll get a few more people uh, joining um, as this evening goes along. So uh, this evening, um, this is a NIAS webinar um, looking into the uh, well, the title of it is uh, Can Robots Take Over the Agri-Industry, um, Agri-Food Industry? It's uh, most topical at the minute, given the different uh, the different uh, uh, struggles that the agricultural food industry faces due to the lack of uh, labour at the minute. Um, so we have two speakers with us this evening, Kit, uh, who is from Harper Adams, um, he's an agriculture and engineer lecturer, um, looking into really mechanical design and the precision farming, um, the research into the future farming systems and really groundbreaking, uh, headline grabbing, you know, world first sort of uh, hand free hectare project that they're doing over there. And um, so it'd be great to hear from, from Kip, everything that's happening over there. We've also got Peter Simpson, who is head of food uh, technology development um, branch at CAFRA. Um, they're uh, looking at a project, pilot project, uh, in combination with Queen's University of Belfast, um, which is looking to provide and promote uh, the manufacturing industry um, and look at how automation and the solutions that it can potentially provide for the industry over here in Northern Ireland and our, and our many food uh, businesses. So. Looking forward to it. Um, just uh, a way of note, uh, we're having a Q&A at the end of the meeting. Um, so if everyone can wait until the end, um, but you can submit your questions throughout the webinar. So if you're thinking of something, um, put it in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, um, where we're unable to, to be able to view it in the chat one. Um, so if you can keep it, keep it in the Q&A, and we'll, we'll kick that off uh, once Peter finishes. So Hannah, what do you know, Kip? Um, so thanks very much. Yeah, no, great. Thanks for having me. I know I, um, obviously I came over and did a joint meeting now, I think three years ago and reported some of the work of Hands Free. And um, we've we've been lucky enough to continue with our work uh, since then, although somewhat uh, pandemic affected. Um, so I'll just start by going over uh, sort of some of the background to the project very briefly um, before moving on to uh, uh, what we're up to now and some of the sort of findings we're, we're, we're coming across. So um, I always like to start with the sort of what are the, the sort of aims of agriculture and what is agriculture? And for me, agriculture is the ability to uh, for the few to feed the many using scientific and technical means. And over the course of the last 8000 years, that, that science and technology has developed uh, continuously and will continue to develop. So even though I turn up places and I speak some things that people see as very scary or sci fi or far fetched, I assure you one day most of it will come true. Um, if we look at that in a nutshell, over the last 100 years here in the UK, we've, we've had a population that's grown from 45 million up to nearly 65 million. And in that same time, the percentage of people working on farms has dropped from 5% down to around 1%, representing around, uh, which represents around 600,000 people now working on our farms, producing the food for everybody else. Um, now, so, uh, and that's gonna continue, and this is a challenge we need to overcome. 
in the same time, we also need to think about uh, the climate change and being uh, resilient to climate change, but also mitigating climate change. Um, so we must adopt to technologies to allow us to reduce waste and increase efficiency uh, that are normally sort of deemed as these precision farming methods and management systems. So doing the right thing at the right time in the right place and in the right way. Um, and we're hoping to break our fields down into subfields and ideally one day plant by plant level management, um, although maybe one day isn't so far away as I will fi finish off with later. Um, the problems we face, uh, so that's sort of the challenges we face, that's what we're trying to achieve going forwards, but we have some problems on our shoulders and, 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 and one I've already obviously laboured on fair, fairly a fair amount, which is of course labour, uh, and this reduced uh, access to rural labour has been a driver for ever larger machines on our farms. Um, as farms have grown, uh, limited time windows have also driven larger and larger machines to, to end up on our farms uh, in the sense that if, if my farm is now two or three times as big as it used to be in order to be profitable, I still only have the same two or three week drilling period, the same six week harvesting period to, to get my crops out, in and out of the field. And therefore, large machines have been seen as a way to uh, make that easier. Uh, something that I sort of say half in jest, but 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 also very true is there is a element of one upmanship within farming and farmers love to look over the hedge and see a big shiny tractor next door and decide they need a bigger shiny tractor. And this is a bit of a curse and it's a curse that the big manufacturers of machinery have teed into and they know that if they add a little bit more chrome and a little bit more bling to the next tractor, they will sell it. And uh, this is something we need to be conscious of and, and maybe think about how can we get away from that in future now the other two things that we we're, that we've that we've come up against is a lack of resolution so we're trying to do precision farming one day we're trying to be plant by plant but these massive machines that have solved the other problems aren't very precise here we see a sprayer that is a 40 meter boom and that sprayer is limited to give a single dose across its whole width so no matter what the crop needs from one side of the boom to the other it's all getting the same thing more or less um that's a big problem uh, uh, and these large machines have limited our, our resolution uh, compaction also has limited yields. And if you look at the graph there, the, the, the graph of yield, you can see that it's more or less flatlined from since the year 2000. And, you know, a lot of that is now being pointed to the soil. And I've been saying this for quite a long time, you know, getting on for 10 years, I've been talking about how soils have limited our yields, but obviously that has become kind of accepted in the last three or four years and is talked about an awful lot. So I, I used to be pushing water uphill with this one. And now I think that most people are on board that we need to regenerate our soils. Uh, and obviously regeneration has become the popular term. So the paradigm is, 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 a, is a small robotic future, a, a, a future where we have really small, precise robots that can be infinitely precise, treat each plant as an individual, therefore reduce the waste uh, on farm, increase the efficiency of our inputs and increase the, the margins that we can access as farmers. Um, these tiny small robots would uh, reduce compaction in our fields and therefore potentially unlock that yield issue. And robots operating in swarms would cover the same area. So large amounts of small robots could cover the same area. Um, they, you know, people say, well, robots are gonna put people out of their jobs, but, but if we're talking about 10, 15, 20 tiny robots in a field, well, maybe we're gonna need quite a few people to maintain those, look after them, set them up, etc. So I'm sure there will be jobs retained and maybe those jobs may even be more attractive to a younger generation. Um, small vehicles are intrinsically safer. So if, if my small tiny robot goes wrong uh, and goes AWOL, it will crash into the fence and, the, uh, uh, and that's about it. Whereas if my quad track from the page before goes AWOL, it could cause some real damage. Um, now, just to put some numbers on this as to what some other potential benefits, if we, if we take ploughing, for an example, if we plough a hectare of land, we move around 1900 tonnes of soil for every hectare. That's an awful lot of mass that's being moved and therefore a lot of energy attached to that in the form of red diesel currently, which obviously the price is going through the roof um, as we speak. The If we go to a system where we have tiny robots that could maybe inject, do micro tillage and inject seeds into the ground and only move the minimal amount of soil, we could move as little as 12 tonnes of soil per hectare. 
That's 150 times reduction in soil movement and therefore potentially a very significant reduction in energy requirement. So potentially small robots open the door for, for electrification on our farms. Now, the thing is, I believe all these things I've just spoke about, but I really struggled with this imagery that seemed a bit unbelievable. And most farmers didn't believe it either when I was talking about this five, six, seven years ago. Um, but if I use the picture of the T20 here and I said to farmers, now, could this be the future of farming? Well, it might seem a bit strange to go back to, to this sort of machine, but, but this was how we farmed 50 years ago. There is no debate that we could generate the food we need using machines of this sort of size, which would be small, light and precise in comparison to what we're currently farming with. Um, and this is where the idea of the hands-free farm, hands-free hectare came from. Could we do an evolutionary stop rather than a revolutionary step uh, forwards? So the hands-free hectare was about using small scale conventional farm equipment, automating them using open source equipment. I had a colleague, Jonathan Gill, who was an expert in making flying machines, drones based on open source equipment. His, his drones are very cheap, very reliable. This is before you could buy drones, he was making them. And essentially, could we take the technology from a drone and make a tractor drive itself, and not only make a tractor drive itself, but go farming with that tractor. And that was the aim of the hands-free hectare, which was different to what anyone else was doing at the time. People were making robots that then didn't really do much. We set the goal of actually farming with our robot. So this is what it looks like. And, and I guess many of you will have seen this before, uh, either with me in person or, or just out there in the wild. Um, but this is our, our very first uh, operation in the hands-free hectare. Within six months of our project starting, we had a tractor that drove itself drilling a crop in our perfectly square flat hectare. Um, we did all the operations in needed to, to grow that crop. So we drilled it, we rolled it. We used various autonom autonomous systems to monitor the crop as it grew in the field. Uh, here we see a scout vehicle pulling back some samples for us to test and, and that crop grew. Now, looking at this crop now, it's uh, got lots of patches. It's not very straight. It's a lot that is very wonky uh, uh, and no one would be very proud to see this field other than me because when we achieved this back in 2017, this was a real step forward in the world of agricultural robotics. But, you know, room for improvement, let's just say. Um, we went all the way on to uh, eventually harvesting that crop using an autonomous combine. And, and, you know, just to reiterate, this was 2017 that this now happened. So a good number, you know, five years ago now, since we, we did conduct our world first autonomous cropping. Um, straight on from that, we were lucky enough to secure a bit more funding, which allowed us to do it a second time. And we're just going to watch the same sequence again now. But, but this time, hopefully, we'll see some, draft, uh, some fairly dramatic improvements. The machines operated a bit faster. They operated straighter. And we ended up with crops that looked a lot better. Um, so we, we ended up with a much greater field coverage um, and, and crops that I think anyone truly would be proud of. Because uh, you know, even though you can see some gaps in that field, that's no different than any arable crop if you send a drone over it. Um, eventually, when we harvested this second crop, which was a winter wheat in 2018, we also managed to do some unloading on the move uh, and get two machines autonomously working together. Um, you know, you can see a bit of plywood there making the two meet. You know, our project is very much about how do we get stuff done? Not all of it's perfect. It's about showing it can be done, not showing that, it, that it's perfection. Leading on from the, the work that we did in the field, we, we spent the year of 2019 uh, developing some uh, navigation technology to allow us to get our tractor to and from the field. So we had developed systems that would talk between the tractor and, 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 and infrastructure. So the gates allow the tractor to open and shut the gates for itself as it drove to the field. Uh, we enabled it to slow to a stop if it sees an obstacle that shouldn't be in the way. Uh, and then when there's, the obstacle moves or the person faints, uh, the tractor can then drive on. So not a perfect system, but, you know, uh, an improvement on where we were before, where our tractor used to completely kill the engine if something was it within its sort of safety parameter. We, we, we got to the point where we were confident that we didn't have to kill the engine. We could just slow, stop uh, and, and make another decision. Uh, so this was the work of sort of 2019 and, and, and where we originally had partnered with Precision Decisions. With this work, we also brought on an extra company, FarmScan Ag. Um, okay, so 
Now, this leads me on to where I really want to talk about, uh, concentrate on, and that is the work of the Hands Free Farm. So we obviously achieved quite a lot uh, with our original project, uh, but but we did face criticism uh, in the sense that the that, that most fields don't look square and flat and then most fields are bigger than one hectare. So we wanted to, 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 to move the project to the next level, replicate sort of that commercial angle and start building swarms of vehicles where more than one vehicle will be working at the same time. And that was the aspiration of a hands-free farm. This is what the farm looks like. Um, it is some land again at Harper Adams. We're now 35 hectares across five fields that are as you would find them, random shapes. We have trees, we have telegraph poles, we have footpaths, and we have to deal with all of those things within our autonomous farming now. The machinery changed a little bit. We got a second tractor and a second drill, as you can see here in the picture. And the, and the key thing to look at there is, is the red bar that's on the top of the tractor's roll cage. This is the technology brought in by FarmScan Ag, and this is where we moved away from the open source drone technology to a proprietary automation system that we are helping FarmScan Ag develop for the commercial market. We have a new sprayer that's a bit bigger because of our bigger area, allows us to cover a bit more ground. And we also got a, a newer, more capable combine harvester, which came all the way from India to be the size and shape that we needed it to be. Um, we have to plan routes around our fields and all of our all of our operations are pre pre planned so there was uh, a lot of attention paid to the sizes of these machines and we have tried to make a sort of pseudo CTF system control traffic so the image in front of us uh, you can see we have a uh, the, the green at the top represents the tractor with a sprayer boom we then the blue ones represent the, the width of the seed drill and the, and the wheels of the seed drill and the lighter green is our combine harvester header and tracks and what we're trying to do is line up all of those operations so we drive on as little as the field as possible so in a, in a large scale CTF system with 12 meter implements you can drive on as little as 24 25 percent of the field with your wheels um we're because our machines are smaller we have to drive on more of the field but we can be as down to around 50 percent of the field is driven on but obviously our machines weigh one and a half tons for our tractor rather than maybe a quad track on a 12 meter system weighing 30 tons so the damage we're doing even though we're driving on more of the field is is fairly minuscule um, the route plans are generated for every implement, so we, we first map the perimeters of our fields, and then depending on the width of the machine, we, we generate new route plans. Um, the, the image on the bottom left shows uh, both the overlay of drill lines, which is, is the sort of the lines you can barely see because there's so many of them, and then sprayer lines, which are obviously at a, a greater width. Now, this field in particular, I've shown because it's, it's one of our most difficult fields. It has five telegraph poles and two manhole covers. And you can see we, have met, we are able to map those, we, we plot those, and our routes that are automatically generated avoid those obstacles in a very perfectly geometric way you can see in this rolling here so a very satisfied ge satisfying geometric pattern you get you end up with which is far better than uh, i could personally drive around those poles um, so again showing some of the improvements that automation can potentially bring in so here we go then this is this is our, i'll take you through our sort of first cropping season we've, we've completed a, a, a single harvest at this point on the hands-free farm and we're, we're on our way to our second so so we grew cover crops in our fields uh, during the pandemic. We, we had limited access, so, so cover crops was all we could manage to grow. So to, to, in order to plant our first winter wheat, we had to top those off. Uh, we had to, 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 to spray them off as well. We conducted some light tillage using some discs in order to, to prevent our drill from getting any getting blocked at all when we out drilling. And here you can see the tractor and the drill. Again, moving fairly quickly, we're, we're operating at five to six kilometers an hour, giving us a spot rate with our two meter drill uh, of around uh, one hectare an hour as we're operating. Um, here again is, is the sprayer. Obviously we spray at a fairly slow, steady speed. It's a, it's a fairly large implement for the small tractor that, that it's on. So we take this nice and steady as we apply chemicals to our field. Uh, and we also put fertilizer on through the sprayer. So, so that's a really key implement for us. 
We'll jump through to harvest and here we can see uh, the combine operating last summer and unloading on the move into the tractor. This is a bit of a longer video and I, I sort of apologize for that, but I don't because what we're going to see here is, is, is the first swarming that we've actually managed to do. So these two machines are talking to each other. The combine is telling the tractor how fast it should be traveling at. They're both traveling on route plans, but the, the combine is governing the tractor's speed. Now, what happens when we come to the end of the field is the tractor says that the combine tells the tractor that it doesn't want it in the way. It doesn't want it next to it because that could potentially cause a collision when we go to turn. So the tractor is told to get out of the way. So we speed the tractor off and we get the tractor to the, the edge of the field and conduct a headland turn prior to the combine in order to, to get these things as far away as possible and therefore prevent uh, the potential for any collisions. Um, you know, it's very tempting to try and make these things turn in perfect synchronicity, but but ultimately we're just like, that's just opening the door for, for, for errors. So off the tractor goes, out the way, and the combine will then conduct its turn uh, separately uh, and safely. Um, so this was this was quite literally, I think this is a video of, of literally the first time we managed to, to make this system all operate. Uh, and we managed it, um, not every unload at all last summer, but uh, we did it probably 15 or 20 times. We, we did, we filled trailers using this method um, and, and coming harvest, we're hoping to be doing this, you know, most of the time with a bit of perfecting of, of some of the control system. Um, You'll always see in, in our shots, there's, there's various people. And obviously at the moment, we, we have an awful lot of observation uh, and people on hand whenever we do anything. So uh, we can often get criticized for having more people in the field than if we were manually driving the machines. Uh, but round the combine goes, lines back up with the tractor. Uh, and once the combine reaches the tractor, off they will start again. To uh, take us to where we are now, this is drilling for our second uh, harvest, uh, harvest to come this year. And again, we've got a bit of a swarming operation. And again, we've made the decision that rather than the tractor with the drill following directly behind the tractor with the cultivator, it just makes more sense to spread them apart a little bit in terms of safety. We could easily have the one following the other, but it just doesn't kind of make any real uh, economic sense. Uh, so we've made the decision to keep them apart. And you can see the, 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 the discs on the left hand side and the drilling on the right hand side, uh, which is probably running sort of half an hour or 40 minutes behind the, the, the cultivation tractor. You can also see in the background lots of my students, because wherever possible, when we're doing work out in the field, we like to get students out to see it uh, and hopefully ask some pointed questions as they always do. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the glamorous uh, jazz hands bit of what we do. Uh, lots of videos of stuff driving around. Um, but I thought I'd take you through some of the sort of more in-depth analysis and work we're, we're, we're doing on this. So one of the things I, I, I've been doing, or I have been working closely, I should say, with, with a professor of economics, uh, James Lernberg de Boer, um, who has developed a, uh, a linear programming model, an economics model, where we can put in different uh, attributes and by um, and essentially the model will run and tell you the, the most optimum set of those attributes, those, those factors to give you the most economic optimum output. Um, so we've got in our model, we have set up four farm sizes. We've got a small farm, a sort of medium farm up to a, a pretty large farm, an arbitrary large farm at 500 hectares. Um, we've got crops that are available to the model being wheat, uh, rape and barley. Uh, the, the model knows when the, those different crops can be planted and it knows when they can be harvested. So it, it takes that into account in terms of the timing of that, that, that work. Um, in the conventional system, we have a small tractor, a medium tractor and a large conventional tractor. We have so 28 horse uh, kilowatts, 112 kilowatts and 221 kilowatts. So as the farms get bigger, the, the model will select the most appropriate tractor. But in the autonomous system, it will keep with the small hands-free hectare size tractor, but just duplicate the number and build a swarm instead. And that's how the model works. 
Okay, so what does this look like? What's the outcome? Well, if we look at a cost of production curve, um, we've got wheat cost of production. The blue line is a conventional farm. So as the farm gets bigger, the size of the tractor gets bigger, which is denoted by the uh, kilowatt reading on the graph. So the two smallest size of, of conventional farm use the smallest tractor, and then the next track, the next gets the bigger tractor, and then the, the biggest farm gets the biggest tractor available. Uh, whereas in the hands-free hectare model, we go from one tractor to two tractors to three tractors operating in a swarm. Now, what this shows is we have reduced the cost of production across the board. No matter what farm size, we have reduced the cost of production. And critically on small farms, we have reduced the cost of production by around 30 pounds per tonne by moving to these small machines, making uh, small farms profitable. If you, if you think of wheat prices uh, this time last year, let's ignore what's going on at the moment. Um, you know, 170 pounds per tonne on a conventional system uh, in terms of cost of production, would not have been making you very much profit, but 140 pounds on cost of production would have been. So, so we've essentially made a small farm profitable by adopting this technology. If you start interrogating as to why this is, um, the small farms become more profitable because we can uh, alleviate staff and allow them to do other things. Uh, and the, 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 the Essentially, the, the, the ongoing costs are cheaper, but in the big farms, the reason that the, the biggest impact on cost is actually the setup cost, uh, whereby the small machines in a swarm, because these small machines are just so much cheaper than very large machines, even though they've now become robotic, we can, you know, we can reduce the, the investment in terms of uh, machinery by, by up to half on the, big on the big farms. So by running small, cheap machines more intensively, we can cut big costs of, uh, of capital on those farms. Further analysis and further delving into this model, we've also built in now, we've got a PhD student, Alamine, who is, is built into it uh, field size uh, with, with, with a particular emphasis on the smaller field sizes, one to 10 hectares that we see an, an awful lot in the UK. And, and you can see that we get a, the greatest operational efficiency, the field efficiency of smaller, far, smaller machines. This is sort of kind of stating the obvious, but it's just putting some numbers to the obvious. The smaller machines are more efficient in those small fields. And when we try and put really big machines into small fields, we get big inefficiency. So the large 300 horsepower tractor in small fields becomes a very efficient, inefficient machine in that environment. Um, so there's a benefit for the, for the standard UK farm size to be using these autonomous machines. And another uh, iteration of this work that, that has, is yet to be published, but will soon be published, is looking at the effect of uh, reliability. Um, so if we take this graph, uh, the blue line is the standard conventional curve from two slides ago, and so is the orange line is the autonomous curve. Um, we then got um, the green lines being autonomous systems that where there's nobody in the field um, and the blue dark blue line is a uh, autonomous machine where there's somebody still in the field observing it which may become law depending on how things go um, so you can see obviously if no one's in the field the green line is preferable to the blue line so if someone's back in the office doing other work or in another field doing some agronomy that is economically favorable but what the problem, the, the thing that this is trying to understand is, is what happens if that machine starts going wrong? And quite clearly, if, if, you, if you take this green line now with the red dots, this is where we've got a sort of troublesome machine, a machine that isn't, that, that, that goes wrong quite often or, or, you know, shuts down because a GPS drops out or whatever. And, and if you're not in the field to fix it and you've got to travel to the field, this becomes very unviable. It, it's, it's much more costly than just sitting on the track to yourself if you're driving backwards and forwards from the farmyard to fix your machine. Again, this is just putting numbers to something that's probably quite obvious. But what it says to me is there's a huge importance in concentrating on the reliabilities of these systems, the reliability of any autonomous systems before they go to market. So we have to be really careful that we're not, uh, you know, as an engineer, we, we don't end up selling farmers machines that, actually are more trouble than they're worth, quite literally. Um, so, so making sure our systems are reliable, repeatable, uh, is, is absolutely critical.
as is making sure the legislation is correct, that we don't end up being hamstrung by being, you know, operators having to walk around behind machines. Which nicely takes us on to the other work that I'm involved with uh, and some of the really critical things that I believe have come out of hands free. Over the last couple of years, we've we've uh, we operate under the UK's uh, the UK government code of practice for autonomous vehicle trialing. But the key there is in the word trialing. We can only use this because we are researchers. If we were doing commercial operations, this code of practice it doesn't work for us and there is no legislation there is no code of practice currently available for farmers who want to use autonomous systems so over the last two years and a number of uh, events both in person pre-pandemic and online uh, we at harper have managed to galvanize interest in developing a code of practice which we have used to sort of uh, take to the british standards institute and uh, we are now as part of uh, uh, British standards, developing a code of practice for the use of the commercial use of autonomous agricultural vehicles. So I am now on the committee for that. Uh, BSI are heading it up and doing the work, but it was the work we've done here at Harper and sort of lobbying them that has made that happen. So that's something I'm kind of quite proud of. Um, as well as that, we've also worked with um, the TRL, the Transport Research Laboratory, who also have developed a, a code of practice for using automated off-highway vehicles, so I fed into that work. And we've worked with the likes of NFU Mutual uh, for them to understand how they might need to insure these vehicles going forwards uh, and what that looks like for their insurance business. Um, so we've worked really closely with them for the last two years with a with number of meetings and workshops. And, and they are very open to insuring these systems. They are not a closed book whatsoever. And we've also been working with HSE. And again, HSE, when I had my first meeting with HSE, I thought this could be a very negative experience, but actually it's been very positive. They, they have seen uh, the potential for automation to make farms safer and therefore are very keen to engage with the likes of, of, of the work we're doing here to learn more about it and make sure that these things happen in the correct way rather than shut it down altogether. So very, very positive. And as I say, this sort of work, this sort of outreach is what I spend most of my time doing. And there's a very clever team of technical guys who are who are making the robots do what they do uh, and developing them. Just as a as a parting comment, that has got nothing to do with hands free, but but something of interest. Um, I sent a tweet out earlier today about this. Um, this is a, a robot called the farm droid. Uh, it's from Germany. It's a robot that, that, that uses solar power and a to very, very slowly, something like 400 meters an hour, trundle up and down a field and plant seeds. As it plants those seeds, it maps where they are using a GPS position, which is something I wrote in an assignment when I was doing my master's about, I think, eight years ago. I wrote about the opportunity to map seeds with GPS and weed them pre-emergence. Well, this is a machine that is doing just that. So once it's planted its seeds and mapped them, it comes back through the field and weeds those machine those uh, it weeds around the the, the seeds pre-emergence. So this is pre-emergent herbicide without any herbicide, uh, which is quite impressive. There's an awful lot of robotic things that are out there hoeing uh, visually, but this is using GPS position. Anyway, I'm rambling now, but the point is, this I first came across this two years ago, but this has now come into the UK, and I went and saw this in the field in the flesh last night. Uh, it's about five miles from Harper Adams. A farm has bought this machine and is commercially operating an autonomous machine to establish a crop this year. So just a really impressive development in this space uh, that I thought I would finish with. Um, that's it from me. Uh, uh, if you, you know, obviously happy to take questions later. And if you wish to follow what we're doing, please find us on Twitter or any of the social medias. And, and we try to keep things updated on there. Thank you very much. That's uh, great, Kit. Thanks very much for a very uh, <coughs> quick and detailed view of what these guys are doing over there in Harper. Um, very, very thought provoking and uh, very exciting to see what other technologies as well that's coming down the tracks um, and being used commercially um, as well. So, very good. Um, we'll uh, hand over to Peter here now, um, who will uh, discuss what uh, Lockery's doing with in conjunction with Queen's um, starting to do, and then at the end we'll we'll have a, a Q and A. So over to you, Peter. 
Uh, hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Thumbs up there. Thanks, 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 folks. Uh, really enjoyed that kit. Really enjoyed it. Um, uh, first of all, thanks very much, Richard, Chair, for, for inviting me along um, this evening. Maybe to tell you about um, some exciting work that's happening, maybe a little bit closer to home and maybe a little bit further down uh, the supply chain. Um, as, you, as you mentioned there, I'm head of food technology at uh, CAFRI up at, up at Lockery campus, uh, and my branch has responsibility for transferring technology and innovation into the local food industry. So. When we talk about robotics and automation, it isn't that new, but it is quite new to our sector, and it's certainly quite new to us in CAFRI. Um, so I was really interested to hear um, Kit talking about machines talking to each other, because in the context of what we call the fourth industrial revolution, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And it's uh, you made it look really easy there, Kit, but it's, it's, it's certainly quite quite tricky. Uh, to do that, but it's highly innovative. So the question was posed, can, can robots take over the agri-food industry? And, you know, the question we have to ask ourselves, well, why would we want them to? And perhaps we might consider the context uh, and, and why, we, why we might want them to do that. I'm going to see if I can just... There we go. Why they might want to take over the, the industry. So we've already uh, talked about some of the major issues. I mean, 2020 and 2021 were really tough years for everyone, not least the food industry. And uh, we've come through and we probably remain in a, in a bit of a perfect storm when we take all of these kind of issues into account. Um, we've mentioned labor uh, costs, you know, the two biggest costs for our food industry are labor and raw materials. Um, EU exit has no doubt had a massive impact on labour availability um, and the fact that the government has increased the, the national living wage, you know, so where the, the food processing industry relied heavily on an expensive labour, the access to that labour is now a problem. Okay. In terms of COVID, um, you know, Three years ago, factories didn't have to think about social distancing, you know, and probably, you know, one of the images of the of the COVID pandemic was the fact that in, in, in our food factories, people were still having to, to work side by side. And we really have to think now about we, how we lay out our factories because, we, you know, we may have pandemics coming and going again. And, uh, that major disruption to the food supply chain just can't, can't happen. Raw materials... Uh, we need to make the most of our materials because on occasions, like when we have war in Eastern Europe, these things can, can really become a short supply. And, uh, that's where we really have to make, make the most of them. Um, we're working with, with lots of new, not new customers around the world uh, with our exit from Europe. And um, there's, a real, uh, there's a real selling point uh, with our products in terms of food safety. And sometimes the, the fewer people handling our food products before we export them, the better uh, in terms of safety and consistency. Um, we need now to start thinking about green growth and thinking about new technologies that can support low carbon delivery. And we need to make things more efficiently with less damage to our national environment. And I think the robotics and automation is a, it fits very nicely in, in, in that context. It's in, our, it's in our interest as well. The, the, the pace of change, uh, as Kit has mentioned, it's, it's, it's progressing so quickly. Uh, and, and we need to keep up with the rest of the world in terms of, of digitization. I, I, did a, I did this talk to a, to a group um, during the week, and we, we were talking about how many, um, how long it takes for a new invention to have 50 million users. Okay. So in that context, the motor car uh, took 62 years to reach 50 million users. Facebook took four years to reach 50 million users. And uh, if you think of that Pokemon app that your kids probably downloaded a couple of years ago, that took 19 days to reach 50 million users. So, you know, when we really are dealing with the pace of change uh, like we've never known before. 
So could, could robots be the solution? And here I'm looking at uh, photographs of a, almost like a hands-free factory kit on the left-hand side. Um, there are a lot of things in the favor of, of robots. Global availability of robots has doubled in the last 20 years. And prices for this type of technology have fallen by 76% since 2010. And other sectors that we see in, in manufacturing have really shown that robots can really improve productivity. And that's somewhere where the UK lags behind. We did mention the fact that, you know, when we talk about introducing robots, we talk about putting people out of work. And that's really not the case. What we're trying to do, what we can do with this type of technology is to replace the low paid, repetitive, um, hard to fill roles with highly paid integrators who make all of this stuff happen and help machines talk to each other. Robots are now uh, more, are smarter, they're more flexible, they're easier to train. They don't take toilet breaks, they don't need holiday pay. So there are a lot of positives. But here in the UK, we haven't really embraced robotics and automation. If we, if we were looking at the top 10 in the world, we're not in the top 10, we're actually not even the top 20. We, we are probably tw 24th in the world in terms of the number of robots per 10,000 employees as a measure. We're the, we're, the, we're the bottom of the league among the G7 countries in terms of, of adoptions. Uh, in case you're wondering, South Korea is actually top of the league table um, with, with the highest number of robots being used in manufacture. But, but all is not lost. The food and drink sector is now the second highest purchaser of robotic equipment in the UK. Okay, uh, it's just behind warehousing. And if you think about it, robots really are going to cost the same price around the world. So those countries which had a manufacturing advantage with, with, with cheap labor costs, that disadvantage will, will soon disappear when we are all uh, working with the universal adoption of, of robotic technology. So there are some, some real positives. There are a few barriers um, that we need to think about. And maybe, you know, when we're in the course of this very, very short presentation, I'll show you how we're, we're thinking we can address them. One of the things, obviously, is skills. Uh, and Kit's mentioned that as well. And being a college um, like Harper, uh, Caffrey is really interested in bringing the next generation on board to be the people who uh, bring this technology to the fore. And that's how we're going to try and fill that gap. We're trying to increase awareness. Robotics had a bit of an epiphany a few years ago, but the industry looked at it, bought some gear, it sat in the corner, and they forgot about it again because labor was so inexpensive. And now we really need to get back and spread, spread the news about this type of technology. Finance is always an issue, and maybe I'll talk in a second about how we are trying to de-risk that, that potential. And of course, providing support and long-term uh, help uh, that, that could be provided for companies who are trying to put this type of technology in place. That's an awful lot for Caffrey to do, and really to upskill ourselves in this tech technology would take quite a few years. And when we talk to some of our, our friends uh, across in GB, you know, that's a long journey. So we have partnered, and uh, I mean, our, our main partner is the Northern Ireland Technology Centre at Queen's University in Belfast, NATC. So NATC know nothing about food, but they have been putting robots and automation into the aeronautical and uh, automotive industries for years and years, and they bring a lot of expertise and knowledge to the table. And when you combine that with my food technologists, I think we make a fairly, a fairly formidable team. But like us, you know, they see the food sector as an emerging sector, which is ripe for automation. And I'll talk a bit about some of the other partners in a moment. So is Caffrey rushing out to buy robots uh, to put into, many of you will know the campus here. No, we're not. Um, what we're doing is... Uh, we are attempting to help food and drink companies start their automation journey by de-risking investment using digital technology. And, and, and by that, I mean doing factory simulations and uh, 
modeling of, uh, of distinct processes using software, readily available uh, software, where we can almost make a digital twin of the factory that we're looking at. Okay, and you'll see a couple of, of, of examples uh, of what we have up there. So how do I explain what this is? If you can imagine um, a factory that's interested in implementing some type of robotic technology, what we can do is simulate their factory. Uh, our colleagues uh, at Queen's can gather all the real time processing data and we can simulate their process in real life. We can import then uh, 3D CAD drawings from all the major equipment manufacturers and we can place them at certain points within their production process. Now imagine what it would be like then for a production manager to be able to put on a set of virtual reality goggles or even augmented reality and walk up and down their digital production line. They can look at different configurations of their line. They can check out different types of machinery. This type of technology, like you can see um, the person right on the right hand side, enables people to look under conveyor belts. It enables them to, to lift themselves up to hover above production lines and see their product passing through the system in real time. And using those processes, we can see if robotics and automation would actually make a difference before they invest in the technology. So what we're trying to do is de-risk that type of investment uh, to enable companies to make probably a lot more sensible and informed decisions about what they're going to do. So what we're doing in this, this three-year project with Queen's is that we're going to do about five different, 25 uh, simulations over the three years. We're going to try and do them across the processing sector with companies large and small, and to try and enthuse the industry to, to embrace this type of technology. I'm just going to show you a very, very simple uh, uh, project. And this is with an SME, so they don't have to be multinational companies. And what we did, we had, we had, a, we had a small um, distillery who um, had a very, very manual bottling process, which involved lots of people. You can see them on the left hand side here. And what we were able to do was to show them different levels of investment from um, a, a collaborative robot that you can see in the, in the, on the right hand side. And I'll, just, uh, I'll just start that up. Um, to um, all singing, all dancing, uh, fully automated systems. So you can see what this is doing. This machine costs probably about 28,000 uh, pounds, but it's reduced the staff, staff input by at least two, two staff. Uh, and say this, this, can, this can work in the dark, it can work all day long, all night, uh, 24 hours a day. And uh, the payback will be, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of staffing costs, it's about a year. So um, this is a collaborative robot and Kit has mentioned the importance of this, the health and safety within all of this. This is really, really important for us. So this is actually a collaborative robot. So a bit like uh, Kit's tractor, if, um, if a human being uh, or anything else comes into contact with this robot, it'll stop. Okay, so it's safe and it's able to work around and that's, that's where we're at. Um, we can get far, far greater um, speeds uh, if we're using full industrial robots, but we have to put them behind cages so that no one, no one gets, gets hurt when, uh, when, they're, when they're working. But uh, certainly that's an example of, of, of a very small company on a very, very modest robotic intervention. Finally, uh, I'll just touch on the future. Um, what we'd really like to do is to take this project and uh, a bit like what Kit has done at Harper, We'd like, to, we'd like to upscale it. And we have a very good relationship built now with Queens. Queens, as some of you know, are the, the main uh, drivers behind an, uh, an automation, uh, an automation, automate, automotive manufacturing innovation center at, uh, as part of the Belfast Regional City Deal. Um, and what we're going to do is take agri-food out of that. 
you're going to take agri-food out of that center because it'll, it could potentially be lost in the middle of aircraft and automotive and all the other manufacturing sectors. We're going to bring it to Lockery campus and we're going to fund it, fund it using the mid-southwest uh, regional growth deal here. So there is potential that we could have a catapult center, digital catapult center here on Lockery campus focused on agri-food. We start at this end of the supply chain and food processing and we work our way backwards to, towards, uh, towards uh, horticulture uh, and, and other projects to help the, the full agri-food sector. And as I mentioned before, we're a college. We're really in here to develop the next generation. We want to see this type of technology embedded in the curriculum. So already we've made a start at that. So our higher level apprenticeship programs have all got modules in robotics and automation. And uh, when they come for revalidation again, um, our, full, our degree programs will have the same. Um, we just want to optimize those opportunities for, for those type of students to go out into the industry and really, really embed the technology. So that's, that's my presentation finished. And uh, I'll hand back to Richard. All right, Peter, thanks very much. That was uh, very fun. Fascinating to be able to see what uh, these guys at Lockery are doing, um, only down the road from a lot of us, and how these are working with local food industries to help bring that mechanization and robotics um, into the factory floor. Um, so we'll move on to Q&A now. Um, I'll probably maybe start it off here. I was just thinking there, it's probably maybe towards uh, yourself, Kit. Um, I suppose on the farm and bringing it to, to Northern Ireland, where smaller farms were as you know, older generation of guys, um, but also they're all facing the same challenges of labor shortages and everything um, that a large farm is facing. Um, I suppose how far away do you see that becoming more prevalent? not only within the UK, but also, you know, maybe coming across to Ireland here and working on farm. How, you know, how far away do you see this in terms of years time that we would yeah. see this? And also, do you need like a policy government potentially maybe to step in to help that transition happen? Um, yeah, so, so my view purely on a technical front was that you know obviously the hands-free show that we could do it technically five years ago um and i said at that time within a sort of decade it would be unsurprising to see autonomous mach autonomous machines on farm and i've basically stuck with that date and and, and the, the rate of change at the moment is only reinforcing that for me. So by the middle of this sort of decade, 2050, uh, 2025, 2026, I will be unsurprised if i if, if i'm driving through the countryside here or over with you guys and i see autonomous systems out there doing something that doesn't mean that every farm has one it doesn't mean that every farm uh, every tractor drives itself but it means that in you know if i'm if i see it i'm not going to be shocked to have seen it you know last night i went out to a field i knew it was there but it was still like amazing that i seen that last night i saw my first commercially operating autonomous vehicle in a field and that's a big deal for me because i've been banging on about this for 10 years so that was a big deal um it won't be a big deal in four years time it won't be a big deal in five years time they they are coming through in terms of support i mean uk gov just had a, a, a support for the adoption of, of robotics but actually interestingly you needed to spend eighty thousand pounds in order to get the support um and the robot I showed you was only about is only seventy five thousand pounds. We didn't even qualify. You couldn't have bought that robot using the government grant. So um, grants will help, um, but I don't think in high value crops. That I have to be very clear. That is in a very high value crop. That machine uh, in high value crops where there's high labour requirements. These things will sell themselves once one person's got one and seen it, and other people see it working. They they will they will sell themselves, and, and they won't need much support to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's good. And I suppose as well from that, you know, you talked a wee bit of there about machinery dealers and and obviously uh, seals uh, that that we see traditionally in here and over the water. Um, you know, bigger machines, 
more productive machines in terms of getting more done in a quicker time. And I suppose that's one thing from you need from the swarm side of things is, you know, with weather and how it changes, it's the big variable. Um, and really for it to really compete in terms of a time scale and getting the work done in conjunction with the weather, you need sort of to adopt that sort of swarm technology really. Yeah, I think I think obviously the benefit of automation that I I don't talk about too much, but but is is elongated work hours and things like that, and in your fatigue, you know, your robot is happy to work. If 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 spraying needs to be done and the best and the wind drops down at three in the morning, your spray, your, your robot spray is quite happy to go and do that compared to your operator. Um, so uh, that's not always the case, and things like harvest, you know, we have to stop at nine o'clock when the dew comes down just like everyone else does you know so it's not a it's not a silver bullet doesn't mean you can just because it's a robot doesn't mean it can work 24 7 depends on the job but it does open up those hours the other benefit the smaller lighter machine has is it actually increases the length of those work windows so in the past there was there was a particular example where we were able to put fertilizer onto one of our fields um, when the the farm net, you know, the the, the Harper farm with the commercial uh, with the conventional equipment couldn't because they were too big, too heavy to get on the field. They were going to sink out of sight. And our machine could get on and put the fertilizer on. So it does open up. You have to look at things a little bit differently, and it does open up new opportunities. Um, you know, I'm I'm very much aware. You know, selling every farm in the UK, my dream of. 40 horsepower tractors is a, is, a, is, a, is a big thing to sell. But but in terms of in certain places in high value, they are going to trickle through. And once the trickle starts, uh, you know, I don't you know, I don't want to predict where they end up. But, uh, you know, I think they're going to be quite prominent fairly quick. Yeah, very good. Um, Declan has asked, you you've probably kind of covered a wee bit there about the cost per acre, including the, the life cycle cost of the machinery against the, the traditional methods, if you can maybe recap that a wee bit. Yeah, so I think I think that came in just slightly before I got to the slide that talked about it. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I think I probably hopefully answered it at least somewhat. Um, yeah, essentially because these machines are so cheap intrinsically, you know, the quad track example, which I know is not hugely applicable to you guys, but you, that's a 400,000 pound machine because you're paying for a hell of a lot of metal, a hell of a lot of oil, a hell of a lot of everything. You know, it's a big bit of kit. Um, my little tractors cost me 20,000 pounds because they're so small and there's not much engineering in them. So, you know, the, the, the depreciation on that, on one of those big quad tracks could buy you in, in a year could buy you three or four of my tractors, you know? So um, mm-hmm. that, that, that's a big, you know, it's a different way of looking at things. It really is. Um, uh, but yeah, and as I say, the the robot that I saw last night, seventy five thousand uh, pounds, as a, as an early early example, you know, I think it seems like a pretty reasonable price for a, for an early example of this sort of technology. Yeah, and will get better and better. And I suppose also with the green agenda coming down the lines, there's probably a better chance of the like of that piece of kit that you seen last night. Obviously, was solar it was part of uh, solar panels and. The likewise with smaller tractors will be easier to be powered with electrification. Yeah, absolutely. So so big heavy draft, like pulling lots of soil mm-hmm. around fields takes lots of energy. And that you can you can read various people's sums on this, but well, John Deere did it last week. That John Deere released an electric tractor prototype. It was around 150 horsepower in, in, in sort of power terms. So you think of that sort of tractor, but it needed it weighed so a normal 150 horsepower tractor would weigh about eight or nine tons and they were saying that in order for it to be have enough battery this thing was going to weigh 18 tons you know monstrous whereas these small light things that are maybe maybe moving a bit slower doing less work to the soil because they're being more precise it it opens up the door for electrification and batteries uh, which which the big heavy stuff is just not suited for the current battery technology we have yeah, absolutely. And kind of, Campbell's asked the question there about the differences in fuel use between a swarm um, working machine versus the comparable conventional. Yeah. Um, large, large yeah, situation. yeah, really good question, Campbell. Uh, we've got all the data. We've yet to analyze it. So we, um, we, we record all the data for our fuel use. Um, we're sort of limited by team and numbers and things like that. But yeah, um, 
we have the data. Uh, it's something I need to set a student as a project to go through all our data and work out what we're using per hectare in terms of fuel and compare that. We can we can obviously directly compare that to the commercial half farm um, and we will do that in future, but I won't want to put a number on it right now. I think when we're looking at it on a daily basis, some operations we seem to be high, some yeah. operations we seem to be low. Um, it's, it's quite interesting. It's not, it's not uniform in terms of our fuel use comparison. That's great. Um, Campbell's also asked there, um, has uh, varied weather and ground conditions been factored into scaling up off the systems? Can you talk a wee bit about there with the fertilizer example there? Yeah, so we, to be honest, the fields, some of the fields we've got have been right a real struggle. We've got two fields that are actually uh, the lowest point on the Harper Farm and, and we'll have spent an awful lot of the last three years underwater. So yeah, we, we have some fairly tricky conditions, but certainly in our, if we take those two fields out of the question, the rest of our fields, um, we, do, we do expand that operational window with our small machines. Uh, we can get on a bit earlier. We can we can get on it. We can keep going a bit later. Uh, tends to be the way. Yeah. Um, just one other question I had written down myself there was: you have obviously looked into. You've been doing the Hans Free Hacker farm there for a while now. Does it uh, deliver in terms of extra yield because you're using that lighter machinery on? Um, I wouldn't like to claim we've got extra yield, but last year our yields were very comparable. Our, you know, our wheat came in at uh, just shy of 10 tonnes a hectare, which compared to historic yields on those same fields is, 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 is good. Uh, it's certainly not, not a yield deficit. Um, we're, we're sort of above average, but I wouldn't like to say that that was all of our doing. Uh, you know, every year is different in farming. Um, yeah. we, we had a very favourable crop of uh, winter beans last year that, uh, that yielded... Um, four tons a hectare which is which is doing pretty well so we we can certainly match yields i wouldn't like to claim at this point where we're blowing them out of the water right okay very good as you see it's very difficult to do that given the weather conditions and other environmental sort of factors swaying yeah. into them um peter um of uh, someone here's asked uh quick asked the question how open is the ni food industry to the new technology um and are you finding them keen to work within this area with you? Absolutely, Richard. Uh, you know, our, our times have changed. And, you know, just before EU exit, it really wasn't anticipated that, you know, robotics and automation would have been a big, big issue in the industry. But certainly that's been the driver. That's certainly been the driver. And, uh, I suppose it's, it's been a bit of, it's been a bit of, bit of a disservice to, to our local sector saying they haven't looked at that already because, you know, lots of really brilliant people out there doing very clever things. Um, 70% of the automation that's in the industry at the moment is all kind of end of line, packaging, palletizing, warehousing. It's the really tricky stuff that, that, that needs to, uh, that will really reduce um, some of the cost and the dependency of labor. You know, we're, we're, you're talking about in, you know, meat boning halls and slaughter lanes and things like that. That's, that's a really difficult stuff where um, some countries around the world are piloting stuff. Australia's really quite good at, at, at uh, uh, piloting um, automated boning halls and things, but you know it's all it's about yield and it's about working with a very high a high value uh, commodity now uh, and doing as little damage as possible to it. You know, so that's the trade off. Yeah, and uh, Tom's asked the question here, and it's kind of linked to that a wee bit about um, the local meat plants in Northern Ireland being labour intensive, and you know are they big enough to afford this investment? Um, to uh, install, he's asked like a uh, meat cut cutting robot. Yeah, as soon as th these meat cutting robots become commercially available, and you know some of the bigger manufacturers are working on those at the moment. As soon as they become available, these companies can de-risk the investment by doing a virtual model and seeing if it actually works for them with their processes, and their factories, and their throughput, their line speeds. You know that's something we do before they. They, they actually invest the money. That's de-risking it and actually proving how it, how it works. Um, that's how it's done in the aeronautical industry before, um, for example, government would step up with, with any funding for capital. It has to uh, it has to be demonstrated that it works first, and that's that's the technique they use is using digital models. Yeah, 
That's great. Um, there's a, another question here in the, the chat box here for Declan, um, for yourself, Peter. Uh, great insights. Digital twin and similar software has been out for years and has seen certain early uh, adopter reviewing in the industry for technology. What do you think are the biggest blockers in adopting the technology um, are in our Northern Ireland food industry? I would say at the moment, it's the skills. It's the skills, you know, when we buy, when people buy new machines for food factories now, they're industry four point ready. They're full of sensors, they collect data. They're producing loads and loads of data uh, every day, but we need people to actually take that data and make some sense out of it and be able to integrate it to make sort of sensible business decisions with it. And that's, that's, a, that's a skill set that is available, but it's in very short supply. And every manufacturing sector wants that type of person. But that, that's, I think that's possibly the limiting factor at the moment. But, you know, we're doing our best with, with the universities and uh, the colleges to try and address those issues because that's, that's, that's right across all manufacturing sectors in Northern Ireland. Yeah, very good. Mm -hmm. Ian has uh, uh, said here, kept fantastic stuff. Um, very exciting. How much does the technology depend on high resolution GPS and communications infrastructure? In rare areas, and I see you've already deep into it and commented there sure. in the bottom. But uh, maybe if you want to go and um, just uh, yeah, so that. yeah, so we ultimately uh, we could operate on a on a standard GPS signal, um, but that would not allow us to go back to the same place. You know, a week later, a month later, whatever. So, in terms of that task to task repeatability it really is critical that you have a correction signal we use our own uh rtk uh, base station and correction signal here um but obviously there are there are now lots uh, of, of of commercial sort of subscription based corrections that would do the job just as well and, and actually that's that's pretty reliable across the country now um the general comms and being able to dial in with your mobile phone or your office computer to monitor these machines remotely is really important and really critical we are we we started with all uh basically radio communication systems and we've moved to 4g uh cellular on the hansfree farm but we're lucky that we have good 4g coverage um on our site and uh this is something i've talked about a lot over the years uh when i'm talking to ministers etc is, is yet yeah, if you want this sort of ag technology not only robotics and automation but any ag tech and and uh, and, and sort of digitalized agricultural systems to take off you really do need to sort out rural communication um uh, infrastructure and, and being able to reliably get on online wherever we are in this country uh and and if we don't get that then you won't get systems being adopted um, so it is really critical, um, and we're just lucky that where we are, we have good 4G coverage. That's great. Um, so just one to finish up there um, from myself, really, uh, is to both of you, really, uh, maybe yourself, Kit, first. What, I suppose, message would you give to farmers that are looking to um, go down this area? Um, of of uh, automation and robotics um, going forward, and is there um, something really to look out for, or you know maybe uh, a, a private commercial um, company that's doing good things in that area? Um, I think it. I think that will ultimately depend on the task you're trying to solve. So I think I think you know going into it just going I want some automation is probably the wrong way of doing this. Much like Peter just said. This is about analyzing your business and, and, and obviously rather than a factory, analyzing your farm and seeing where the pinch points are. Where do we have a labor issue? Where do we have a precision issue? Where do we have a data issue? Um, and, and, and identify what you need. And there are all sorts of companies springing up doing all sorts of things. So certainly high value weeding and sort of that sort of stuff in high value crops is is there is an abundance of machines doing that and, and that's where one of the real big needs is um but but you know you if you look to the livestock sector you've got automated uh you know systems for 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 um 
feeding up in, in sort of dairy housing coming through you know there's a number of options that are doing that now um you know so i think it's about looking at your business and and there is there are plenty of companies out there trying to fill those gaps um and if you go, don't find one come and come and talk to me and uh, i might know one and if not that sounds like a new project <laughs> so very good and yourself peter there just yeah. to maybe go, 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 go. I, 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 Totally agree um, with the food industry. It really is a two-stage process. So the first stage in the process is really look at your at your data and look at where the pinch points are. You may not even need uh, any automation intervention. It may be just that you haven't had that that, that kind of helicopter view of your process uh, and look looked at the information that's in front of you before you move to that next stage of actually implementing and throwing some technology at it. That's great, man. Um, uh, thanks very much for joining us on behalf of NIAS. I'd just like to say a great thank you from uh, the both of you. It's been great learning um, from uh, both sides of the food industry, um, from obviously the field to the factory and how uh, uh, robotics is playing uh, as part and will continue to play a more important role going forward. Um, this webinar obviously was open to everyone. If you're not a member of NIAS, I'd just like to make a plug and potentially get in contact with our secretary too to, to join with a number of different meetings happening throughout the year like this. Um, so uh, it'll be great to get the both of these guys back on maybe in a, a year or two's time and see what else has happened sure. since then again um, and find out uh, you know where, where the industry is traveling um, from there. So. No, thank you very much, man, for, for coming on. Um, and I think we'll wrap it up there. So cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.